Um, today, we're going to continue chapter 52. We may finish it, I'm not sure. But what's more important is, I'd like today, if possible or practical, anyone who has questions, today's a good day to ask the questions on the subject. And the reason is, we're dealing with a very interesting um, concept, which is not usually how Tanya, when we learned the classes in the past, the process how we go, it's usually discussing um, the effect of our knowledge of God and our lives and our function. And here we're talking much more philosophical and something which is more um, discussing about Hashem itself, his relationship to the world. It's a little more unusual, a little more, um, I don't know if it's complex as much as it is out of our regular conversation. So for the subject that needs to be explained more, and if I could explain it, I'll be happy to go back and address it because I'd like that we should understand this because it is interesting ideas. And there's a lot of my marm that just talk about this particular detail, uh, the detail of Malchus, what Malchus is, Hashem's relationship to the world, um, our limited understanding of Hashem. So if there's something that somebody wants to ask, today is a good day to ask questions. First, Baruch HaTawah Adenoi, Elohinu Melech HaElam, Shachel Niyotarei. Two? Two? Two Ben Zion Ben Bina. Ben Zion Ben Bina, Shachel Shalema. And Miriam Bat Rachel. And Miriam Bat Rachel. Yehudit. Yehudit. Shabir Refua Shalema. Okay, so we are, uh, we're going to go back just a couple lines. For those who are following inside, we're on page I and um, Gimel, which is, would be 145. And we're discussing and trying to understand this idea of Hashem from the metaphor of the human body, of the soul, the brain, and the body, the idea of Hashem's Shechina, Teda, and the world. That's really what we're doing. It would be good to take two minutes to explain uh, the spheres. I'm going to go back and explain this first a little bit more clear. And the purpose of this is to understand the process of Torah coming into the world, and in particular to understand what is Malchus. And obviously, these ideas are discussed different in different places, but this is the general understanding of the spheres. When it says Hashem created man in his image, one of the most common interpretations are that Hashem created us with all the spheres and characteristics that he used to create the world. Hashem, of course, is above understanding, above any ability to understand. If you understand God, you become God, because Hashem and his knowledge is one. But obviously, Hashem gave us a little part of himself that we could grasp. What is that? So let's ad address the spheres. The spheres in the creation of the world and the spheres, meaning the powers of the soul, the neshama, are ten. Even though there's something higher called keser, but usually there's ten. Chachma, Bina, and Das. Chachma, Bina, and Das are the, called the cognitive or the intellectual capacities or abilities of our neshama. Those are used by my, our mind, but the neshama has three cognitive powers. Chachma, Bina, Das. Chachma, translated a little more technical, is conception. Like the initial um, Chachma actually is the ultimate level of Bittal. Why is it Bittal? Chachma, meaning nullification, putting yourself aside, because Chachma usually comes when you least expect it. It's an idea pops into your head. Where did it come from? Not because you were trying so hard, not because you were trying so hard to get an answer, it's because suddenly it popped into your head. You don't know where it came from. The metaphor would be like like a lightning flash. Boom, a flash of lightning, but now what? Now that's got to be that, conce that conception, that initial idea, that dot, that drop, has to be developed, called Bina. Bina is comprehension. Taking that idea and developing it. That's why we use the metaphor constantly. Chachma and Bina of Ava'e, mother and father, or father and mother. The father gives a tiny seed, and the mother takes that seed and develops a Bina idea. That seed in it has really everything, but nothing can be seen. It has to be developed. If you lose the opportunity, it's lost. Like any idea pops into your head, you don't immediately develop it, it's gone. Same as the seed. And that is developed Bina into a full idea, full uh, understanding idea. That is Chachma and Bina. Das, which is not always used in the tower of all the Amidas, of all the uh, spheres. Sometimes we leave Das out, we add Keser instead. But Das is um, application. What does that mean? You can have information, but it means nothing to you. 
You could know smoking is bad for you, but it doesn't change your things. You could know it's not wise to say these things to your spouse, but you say them. Why? Because your knowledge and you don't connect. There's a disconnect between what you know and what you do. It's called the applications missing. Not application like an app and a phone, but application like applying what you know. I know something, I don't apply it. But that's really is application. The metaphor we use it in uh, Chassidus is that hinge that, or that link that creates the locomotive for the train. You can have the most powerful locomotive and the most beautiful train. But there's no hinge or no whatever that piece is called that links the locomotive to the rest of the train. Nothing happens. Well, it's like I had so much energy and power, but there was no connection. That's Chachma bin Andas. Chesed Gvur Teferes Netzach Haid and Yisaid represents the six characteristics and middays that really are a person's function. And they're middays, they're character, but they're also emotional. They're all driven by emotion. It's all emotional based. They are called children because these children come from intellect. If a person properly develops an idea, if you think about how much this family saved your grandparents and the Nazis, if you think about how much this person is destroying your family, you'll come to either love or hate the person. But chesed and gvur don't really mean kindness and strictness. It really means attraction and rejection. Chesed is attraction. I want to be close to something. I want to connect to something. Gevura is rejection, either because I'm afraid of it or because it's not good for me. Now, oftentimes, chesed is also out of calculation and gevura giving with a calculation. That's why the father is called chesed and the mother is called gevura, even though the mother is a much bigger giver, because the mother knows each receiver what they need. And the father is like, yeah, whatever. But in general, chesed is attraction and gevura is rejection. That leads to all the things of I love someone, I want someone, I feel that's chesed, attraction. Gvur is rejection. I don't want it. I don't want to be close to it. Either because I'm afraid of it or because I'm in awe of it. It's the Grand Canyon. It's the Atlantic Ocean. It's a giant um, scary thing. I don't want to be near it. It's too big for me. I'm in awe of it. I stand disconnected from it. Then you have Teferis. Teferis really is, we call it a combination of the two, but it's really a third thing called commitment. Teferis means I'm putting myself aside. It's not about me. It's not about my chesed. It's not about my gevura. It's something, uh, something of putting myself aside and I'm feeling the other. What does the other person need? Empathy means it's not what I need, it's what the other needs. The best example for empathy is the word rachmanus. Mercy comes from the word rechem, which means womb. What's a womb? A womb is a part of a person that the mother says, you know what? I'm putting self aside and I'm making room for someone else within me. It's my space, but I'm putting self aside. That's why rachmanus is, is the essence of the ferris of empathy because I'm putting self aside. Those are the first, that's usually called uh, the, the right side, left side, and the womb. That's the, uh, that's Chesed, Gvur, and Teferis. The next three, again, there are three triangles. The next three are Netzach, Heid, Yisaid. Netzach is usually the right thigh, which we resemble, which is the idea of resilience. Something is not easy, but I, I have the ability, sometimes it's called victory, Netzach, victory, resilience. I'm not allowing this challenge to put me down. I'm going to overcome this challenge. That's why it's called a thigh, because it motivates you. It's what, what's the thighs? That's what you walk. That's the, the muscles in your feet. It motivates me. There's two things that motivate me to do something. What's the biggest motivators? Either I'm resilient, that's Netzach, or I'm submissive, I'm Haid. Haid means I put my, I, I'm, I'm giving in. Either my boss challenges me, or my boss intimidates me. I'm either, but I'm doing what the boss wants, either because I'm going to overcome other people. My response to people is, either I'm resilient, I overcome a challenge, or I give in to the challenge. Those are the two responses. Yisoyed represents the usually reproductive organ, which is connection. Mm -hmm. It's the yisoyed, again, similar to das. It's the connection. It is applying or connecting to something. Yisoyed is connection. Those are the six middays. Malchus is already a whole different category. And the six middays are all called usually male or masculine. Malchus is the feminine, which is really, uh, Malchus has probably the most definitions of any mida. Malchus is called sometimes charisma, sometimes it's called speech, it's called kingship, but it's all about one primary theme. Malchus is about one theme. It's not about me within me, it's me projecting to other. It's either me speaking to somebody else or me um, sharing with someone else, giving of myself to others, um, developing something else. Malchus always is taking from our level and let's say the most common translation of Malchus why Hashem is called Malchus and created in the world, is speech. The, def the purpose of speech is primarily for someone else. For me, I don't need speech. 
It's like the definition of a king. The definition of a king is only if there's someone else. If, like we, met, we said many times, if you have a king and there's no one else, no subjects, you're not a king, just a guy with a lot of money or you're a rich guy. A king needs others. It's like um, we say success in business is like Malchus. You have to have customers that make you who you are. If you have no clients or customers, how are you successful in business? How are you successful king? You have to have somebody who's your client, your customer, your, your something. Malchus requires, production requires other. That's Dibur. That's what we say, Hashem created the world with speech. Means Hashem projected that which was inside of himself to others. So Malchus also is unique. That it really has no identity for itself. Everything Malchus is, is revealing that which is inside. I have emotions. I have intellect. I have feelings. And I'm sharing that with others. That's Malchus. I am projecting. I'm sharing. That's why we say Malchus really is a feminine aspect of the masculine relationship. Because the Zah and the Malchus together produce a child. It's that which produces results. It's all result-oriented. That's Malchus. Why is it so important? Because if we're going to discuss now how Tira is a vessel and a conduit and a cloak and a vehicle for Shechina, we have to understand the process how Tira comes into the world. So all this is important to have an idea. We said last week that we had a problem. Shechina, so Hashem concealed himself to the point that he hid 99.99% of himself but only allowed a tiny bit called Shekhinah to be revealed into the world. But this Shekhinah is so powerful, we can't look at it, we can't see it. We got, if we have Shekhinah unfiltered, we disappear. Hashem said, I got the process of Teira. So last week we asked, one second, if Teira is the, is the vehicle and the vessel, why isn't Teira burnt up? We said, nah, Teira is really much higher than Shekhinah. It comes from a much higher source. We said, Teira comes from Hashem's Teira comes from Hashem's Chachma. Teira Chachma Nafkis. If Teira is the higher, and if Shechina would burn us up, how is Teira a cloak, a cover? How is Teira concealing and protecting us from the power, from the energy of Shechina if Teira is higher? And that's what we started saying last week, that Teira really has two aspects. Teira has the aspect, of, it's a paradox. On one hand, we said like water that flows in the highest place, it's the same exact water. At the same time, it comes down there, Hashem allowed Teira to enclose itself in the physical, to apply, even though Teira in truth talks about spirituality and the essence of God, the wisdom of God, things that the mind can't grasp. Hashem put it down in laws of um, Shabbos, laws of kosher, laws of um, Shemitah, laws of Lulav and Esrig. And not only in laws, but actually there's a law that if a cow bumps into a cow, how much you have to pay? 50% of the damage, the whole damage is the first time, is the second time. We actually took Teda, we, Hashem took Teda and uh, inserted it into material stuff. And we could connect to the material part of it. And we connect to the material part, since Teda is one, the material is the part we can relate to. The essence of Teda is the part that we can relate to, but because it's one, we connect with the essence of God. And that is a paradox. That's an impossibility. Why? We're saying that the Teda, which is unlimited, the most powerful, the most uh, unleashed power of God, is enclosed in the most material, limited part of existence. It's enclosed in a in a uh, lulav, in an esrig, in a mikvah, in a in a whatever you want to, use, example you want to use, the laws of a sheep and a goat in the base of Mikdash. How is that possible? And the last thing we said last week is, to explain that, is that the ultimate definition of believable, of infinite, is that it's not limited to being infinite. If someone, like we said, if, if Einstein could only explain his information to a college professor, then he's not really unlimitedly knowledgeable. The sign of the true brilliant scholar is when he can explain his idea to a child. Shleir Melech went down 3,000 levels. When you can actually show that my brilliance can even be explained to a child, it used to be, it used to be a few years ago, a great chassid in uh, uh, Montreal, his name was Rabbi Zalman Marazov. Zalman Marazov was a brilliant, brilliant chassid and scholar. He would, every Shabbos morning, one of the more difficult things to learn is the Kodat Torah from the Alter Rebbe. He started giving a sheer Shabbos morning in the Kodat Torah, but how did it start? He had a five-year-old son, then even years ago. He would sit his five-year-old son across and teach him the Kodat and he taught it that a five-year-old, not, whether his child understood or not, doesn't matter. But the reality is people came by to listen. He's explaining it so clearly and simply. A lot of times you tell, uh, someone can say, it's too hard, I can't explain it to you. <laughs> if you understood it, you can explain it to me. If you can't, it's not because it's too hard. It's too hard for you to explain it to me. It means the ultimate wisdom and brilliance is when you can bring it down to a child. The same way the ultimate, in, and his, his class became, by the way, a very popular class, well attended, but he officially spoke to his child. Um, his the same ideas with Hashem. 
ultimate infinity, infinity really, un- ultimately being infinite is that I can also be finite. If someone says it's so high that it can't connect to the world, then it's true, it's high, but it's not infinite. Infinite means that I'm not limited to infinite and finite. I can express myself anywhere. If Hashem can't express himself in the physical, that means he's limited. So Hashem is unlimited. Therefore, Teira can at the same time, and this is something our minds can understand how, at the same time when it's one with Hashem and his essence, the wisdom of God, that we say, who are who are you, uh, Mada? Who are you, Dua? He is the one who knows. He is the information. He's the thing that's being known. Is all one because that's Hashem. That level at the same time doesn't outrule the possibility of being clothed in a goat or a pirate fillin or in a esrog. That's what we are up to now. Now let's talk about how Torah becomes a vehicle of bringing Shechina into the world. So we have Shechina, and just to remind ourselves is the essence of God. It's much higher than Shechina, and now it's not God with two different essences. Hashem allowed a certain part of himself to be grasped and understood. Someone asked me last week, we were learning a Maimar on Shabbos, why does Hashem have to follow the rules? Why can't he go? We talk about Hashem through a process of chesed and gevurad. Why? Why can't he just do what he wants? He could. But Hashem wanted to give a level of creation that we could understand. The whole point was, let Hashem, Hashem wanted to create or make a part of himself perceivable that human beings could sit here and say, ah, that's, that's a, to understand the process. Otherwise, the truth is Hashem doesn't need to have any rules. Hashem is ruleless. He's ruleless. All right, so we're on page I and Gimbal. Um, and we're about 12 lines, 10 lines to the bottom, the second, the last word on the line. Moshe, could you um, mute everyone? Someone's uh, making a lot of background noise. <laughs> okay, let me see who Thank it is you. here, and I'll try yeah, to mute so them. So the recording will be better. Thank you. Yep, I did it. Got it. Okay, I figured perfect. out who it was. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. When you say Torah, you mean not Torah, only Russian uh, So Tamar is asking an excellent question, which we're going to address today. Uh, which Torah are we talking about? Torah Shabbat, Torah Shabbat, Peh. I mean, there's the oral Torah, there's the written Torah, there's the Mishnah, the Talmud. What are we talking about? Excellent uh, point, because we're going to actually discuss that in this, today's class. What part of Torah are we talking about? So first we have to know is Torah is the vehicle, and not to forget our constant parable, Teira, if you want to take Shechina, um, Teira, and the world, that would be Neshama, brain, and body. Just remember that. Shechina is the metaphor for the Neshama, or the Neshama's metaphor for the Shechina. Mm-hmm. Teira and brain are synonymous, which means the brain of our body, which takes the soul and uses two things to happen. The soul, the, the brain does two main jobs. It brings life to the body, every live equally, and it brings individual gifts to the body. The fact that the eyes can see, senses, the powers, abilities. Now, just for the side note, and this is, we're going to get to this in a few minutes, but it's good to remind ourselves. There's a concept that says that sleep is 160th of death. Why is it 160th of death? Why, how does that concept come up? We say, one of the reasons you say in the morning, Modani, Thank you, Hashem, for returning my soul to my body. So we say sleep is 160th of death. What does that mean, 160th of death? Maybe it's 90% of death. Maybe it's almost, I mean, your eyes, ears, your body's closed down. You're, you're lying to some people go into a deep sleep. Try parents to wake up a teenager. Good luck. You know, sometimes sometimes even not just a teenager. Sometimes anybody. They, a deep sleep. What, what does it mean, 160th of death? So it's a very interesting thing. We spoke about this a while ago. Our brain function that we know of called a conscious brain is not even one sixtieth of our existence of our brain. What does that mean? The amount of calculations and instructions going on at any given moment of the day, not just when we're awake, but even when we're sleeping, is unbelievable. You need 10,000 computers to calculate the temperature of the body and the, uh, all the stuff going on with your brain that's governing and directing and instructing and modifying and, and modulating the body is unbelievable. What the brain does to every single limb and every single organ and every single calculation for the eye, the ears, the nose, the breathing, the heartbeat, the temperature of the blood, the speed, the it, it's incredible calculations down to the most minute, minute level. It's if they had to figure it out on a computer, it would be, I don't know how I mean, unbelievable. Yet that's all going on in our subconscious. Our conscious mind thinks one thing at a time is so it's nothing, meaning our mind that's sleeping is one sixtieth of what's really going on in our body that's awake. 
Our body is basically 99% awake. What's sleeping? Our conscious self is sleeping. But the main part, the active part, the, the complex part is fully awake and functional. The heartbeat, the breathing, the lungs, the eyes, the senses, the temperature, everything. The same thing is like this. When we have the brain, what we see in the body, the Torah that we see in, in, implemented, the Shekhinah, etc., we're seeing one sixtieth of it. Meaning, what do you see? Could you define your neshama by the parts you see in your body? Oh, look, my fingers move and my eyes can see. What a great neshama. That's nothing. That's a tiny part of the neshama that comes into your brain that you don't even see. You're only seeing the conscious part of your function, which means you remember what you're seeing of Torah, what you're seeing of Shekhinah, is the very, very tip of the iceberg. It's like, wow, what a big iceberg. That's like 30 feet tall. No, it's like a thousand feet that you don't see under the water. There's, there's a tremendous amount that we don't see of what our neshama is. And the same thing is when it comes to regard to the metaphors of Torah, what we see of Torah, what we see of Shekhinah is a, is a fragment. Nevertheless, Torah is this vehicle that brings Shekhinah into the world. Or how? And Tamar started asking the question. Let's go into it. We're last line, last word on the page of Ayin Gimel. Let's start. Last word on the line, about 10 lines from the bottom of Ayin Gimel. Now this Torah, like we said, water that flows down from a higher level to a lower level to lower level. Torah is flowing down into this world. So Torah carries within it. It's like a vehicle, like a car that's carrying with it, schlepping along the Shechina. The Shechina also comes down from world to world. Now, again, let's not forget that the Shechina in the story here is the metaphor of the Neshama. That means the life force. So the Shechina is the life force. It's what creates. It's what the, the, the 10 expressions of creation. It's what gives life to the world right now. The Shechina is a life force. The Torah, I mean, if you remember, we spoke about a month ago or three weeks ago, four weeks ago, that that's why every single thing we have in the world comes through Torah. Someone who has a, a, a deficiency in somewhere, Hashem said, uh, uh, um, the Rebbe said, check the mezuzahs, check this mitzvah, increase in kosher. How does that help? Because everything comes through Teda. Everything has to come through Teda. So Teda carries the Shechina as a vehicle into each world. We start off this chapter, or this set of chapters in 51, was asking about how could you have a place called Kedosh uh, Kadashim that has a presence of Hashem? Isn't Hashem everywhere? So we say now we're going back and explaining that in every single world, when we say every single world, right now we're referring to the four primary worlds of Atsilus, Berea, Yitzir, and Asiya, there exists what's called the Kedosh HaKadoshim of that world, and we'll see soon the Torah of that world. Like it says in Zayar and in Eitzchayim, Zayar written by Rabbi Shimba Yechai, and Eitzchayim, who was written by the student of the Rizal, or Chaim Vital, the Shechina, which is Malchus da Atzilus. Now, coming again, the first revelation we have of godliness in a measurable form is uh, Malchus da Atzilus. Um, I'm just going to skip the brackets and go back in a second. He mislabeshes behechel kedush kodesh kedoshim libria. So the Shechina, which comes from Malchus da Atzilus, again, Malchus being the ten spheres, the last of the spheres of Atzilus, becomes. The Chachma bin Adas, the Chabad. By the way, the reason why Chabad's called Chabad mm -hmm. and the Polish Chassidus is called Chagas is because our whole theory was that we not, don't just have feelings and love and warmth and fear of God, which are very important and very important, very fundamental to Yiddishkeit. We have more than that, we have Chabad. We try and understand and grasp and appreciate the intellectual part, the higher part of Yiddishkeit. So that's, that's why Chabad's called Chabad, because it's officially supposed to focus, if we live our lives properly, on a much more intellectual and cognitive concept of Yiddishkeit. Okay. So the Malchus of Atzilus, the lowest level of Atzilus, becomes the top of Chabad. Let's go back for a moment now and see the brackets. And that becomes the Holy of Holies of Berea. So just to so the Malchus of Atzilus, the lowest level of Atzilus, the expression becomes the highest level, the Holy of Holies of the world of Berea, which is the second of the four worlds. Okay, let's go back for a moment. We said Malchus de Atzilus. What's Malchus de Atzilus? This is why I wanted to explain before what Malchus does. The Malchus is the speech, so to speak. Shehi bechinas gili baruchu. What is Malchus? Malchus here means the revelation. If I have a feeling inside of me, and I, for example, am very concerned about something, and no one here knows about it, when I use my Malchus, if you use Malchus here, it means the mouth, my speech, suddenly everyone here becomes aware of it. 
So what shared, what allowed me to share with you that was in me? Malchus. What allows Atzilus to share to Bria what's within it? The Malchus. Now it's not speech in the way we know speech, that it's not words that are moving and making sounds and sound waves, but it's expression from one level to the next. And that's what the bracket is explaining. Shemer Le'elamais, it is the Malchus of Atzilus that allows the share to other worlds. Dvar Havaya. And that's why Malchus is called the Word of God, Baruch Piv Kavayachal, and the speech, the, the ear of God, Al Derech Moshal, it's a metaphor. Adam, like a person, Hadibur, the speech, Humagala Machshafte, what a speech to reveals that which is in your thoughts, Hastumaj, which was hidden, when Nelman concealed Hashemim. So just explaining here why is Malchus that Silas called Malchus that Silas, and why is that the level that shares with the rest of the worlds down to Bria? Because Malchus represents Dibur representing the part that shares what's inside of me with someone else, or in other words, what shares what's concealed to the lower levels. And this picture of the world, Atzilus, everything is there but hidden. In Berea, you can't see anything. When Malchus the Atzilus shares its essence, its secrets, its energy, its light, its spirituality, with Berea, that's called Malchus, it's called Dvarvai, it's called sharing. Okay. So the first thing that Taita does is Taita goes from Malchus Atzilus into Bria, and the process it carries along with the Shechina. Shehi Chabad Bria, which that is the cognitive powers, the seichel, the intellect of Bria, ubeslab shuson the Malchus de Bria, and now once you have the Shechina carried down this vehicle one level down into Bria, so you have now a couple things happening. Nivru haneshomes ba Malachis Bria. Suddenly you have souls and you have angels of Bria, top of the next page. And then we come to Talmud. And this is, I'm going to give now a little bit of introduction to the next page. The Alter Rebbe is going to explain something very interesting and cool. That Talmud is primarily found in Atzillus. When we say Talmud, we mean the essence of Talmud. We divide Torah in general into three parts. It says a person should take his day and divide it into three parts. One third Mipra. One third oral uh, written Torah, which means Chumash, Navi, the book of Yecheskel, um, you know, Parshas Breshis, Nayak, Lechlecha. That's one third should be Mikra. One third should be Mishnah. Mishnah is the same synonymous in this case as Halacha. Mishnah, because what's Mishnah? Mishnah basically is a short thing. This is Aser, Rabbi Hillel says, Rabbi Hillel says Mutter, Shammai says Aser. You know, Rabbi Akiva says this. All it is a bunch of yes and no's. And the Talmud, which is the third thing you should divide your day up, one third of the Talmud, is a logic. Talmud really is, when we want to talk about Talmud, is really, it's the logic, the analysis, why. The whole Talmud is not just that some, the Mishnah sounds like, one rabbi pulled his beard and said, hey, that's forbidden. The guy says, no, that's permitted. Well, what's their logic? We'll see, we'll discuss it in a minute, how they got there. But the Talmud goes and explains why. In other words, we're going to see, I'll explain it, I guess I'll say it now. Mishnah is emotions. What does it mean something's permitted or something's forbidden? We said, if you're going back to Chesed and Gevurah, it doesn't mean something I like or don't like. It's more than that. That's just a, that's a symptom. Chesed is attraction. Gevurah is rejection. What does Hashem attract it to? And what does Hashem reject? And therefore, we should attract and we should reject. When something is permitted, that means Chesed. I'm attracted. It's allowed. It's good. Something is forbidden. It's rejection. So all you have in the Mishnah is really the emotions. So it's... Um, Rejected, it's uh, attracted, it's uh, allowed, it's not allowed. It's um, for him, don't give, do take, take, you know, empathy. It's all the emotions as they're expressed. So Mishnah is all emotion. Talmud is all intellect. All intellect, it's all ideas. What's Mikra? Mikra is, as we'll see, is just uh, going to be, we, I guess we'll say, let's have an action for now. We'll say it's action. Mikra is very interesting, even though it's the highest source. What's very interesting is halacha that you can only make a bracha on something that you're going to do. I can't, I can't make a bracha now, Baruch atah Hashem, Shachak on the and go, ah, it smells so good. Why? Because the bracha is on, is on drinking it. If I make a, a bracha on spices to smell it, that's a different thing. What determines if something has to be eaten or understood or smelled or this? It depends on the product. Spices, you can make a bracha to smell. Food, the bracha smell doesn't help. I got to make a bracha to eat it, even though coffee does have a great smell. It's unique, different than many other foods. Mm -hmm. So the same thing is true when it comes to Torah. If you want to make a bracha on Torah, you can't just make a bracha and read a page of Talmud and not understand it. You didn't fulfill the mitzvah of studying Talmud. You don't understand it. Chumash, you don't have to understand. Reading a Pasuk Chumash, 
I have no idea what it means. Brish is borrowed like Kimmy's or Shmai's hearts. I have no idea what it means. I got a mitzvah. Because in Chumish, intellect is not a factor. It's just the action of saying it, which is why when someone's called to the Torah to get an aliyah, Ya'amad, Rabbi Yain called to the Torah. We don't say it one second. Before we make the bracha, do you understand what you're reading? We don't understand it. Why are you making a bracha? It's like a guy, I make a bracha now and eat this. I don't, I don't eat it. I'm, I'm fasting today. I can't eat it. I'm allergic to it. How can you make a bracha before you know? Because by Torah, it doesn't matter if you understand it. By Chumash, when I say Torah, I mean written law. Torah Shabbat Sav. It doesn't matter. You get a mitzvah every time you read a Pasuk of Chumash. Every time you read a Pasuk of Tillam. It doesn't. And Tillam actually could count as prayer and as learning. It's a separate, unique thing. But anything you read in the Chumash or, or Navi or uh, Ksuvim is the mitzvah is reading it and saying the words. It doesn't matter if you understand it. That's the mitzvah. Talmud, if you don't understand it, there's no mitzvah. There's no mitzvah of Torah study. You can read Talmud. I have no idea what I'm reading. Well, you don't get a mitzvah. What do you mean? I spent an hour reading the Talmud. You have no idea what you were saying. You don't understand it. The mitzvah is to understand it. So we see, as we'll see in a minute, how Hashem manifests himself in the Torah is going to depend if it's uh, depend if it's Talmud, the intellectual part of Torah, is it Mishnah, the emotional part of Torah, or is it Chumash, the action part of Torah, the, the as we'll Midrash, see in a moment. Rabbi, Midrash included in the Mikra. Midrash is the same as Talmud. Ah, wow. Midrash is the same as Talmud. Midrash is actually the same authors. The authors of the mm-hmm. Talmud and the Mishnah and the authors of the Midrash were the same people. Many times you find that um, they lived in the same generations, the same mm-hmm. times. A lot of them were the same authors. Okay, but let's now see this inside. Um, the Gami Shum Nimshah Talmud Shalafanenu. So the Talmud we have today comes to the world of Bria. So interesting, Talmud's a very high, advanced world, the world of Bria. Like we said earlier, I think it was in the, in the 30s somewhere, one of the 30 chapters. It's in the world of Bria where it shines there. The wisdom of Hashem, the knowledge of God, the intellectual aspect of God is the essence of God. That means really a light from Matzilus. It's shining and resting inside the world of Bria. Where does the Chachma Bina Das of Hashem reside? In the world of Bria. But it's a very contracted level. It is now, I don't like to, God forbid, God forbid, use the word dumbed down, but it's a very um, what's it called when you minimize something when you work you pick something until it gets minimized it's very minimized of what it was there before concealed. sorry concealed concealed or reduced as well, reduced okay. it's a reduced it's concealed reduced it's a much more lesser form why in that world lives we said Bria lives the worlds of great neshamis and the greatest of the souls of the of the angels mm-hmm. if they want to appreciate it they got to relate to it. The Torah, the way it is in its source, and the Shambas can't understand it, the angels can't understand it. You have to realize what we're talking about here. The angels can't understand it. So if the angels want to understand it, Hashem has to say, you know what? All right, let me remove 99%. I'll give you guys the part you can understand. Here, there's a little the cookie, you know? I know you can't appreciate the sushi. You can't appreciate the, the partially medium rear or rear steak because you're a child. I'll give you a cookie that you or hot dog that you understand. Hot dog is not the best. For a child, a hot dog is good. For an adult who appreciates good meat, who like it, either rear or medium rear, whatever, I'm giving you the lesser of it, but at least this you can relate to. So Hashem takes from uh, Atzilos, the Chacham bin Adas, and inserts it into the world of Bria enough that the Neshamais and the Malachim could understand it. Shehem Balik Vuvatachlis. Because let's face it, angels are limited. The proof that the limit is, you can say there's one angel, there's two angels, there's five, there's higher angels, lower angels. If they're unlimited, they can't be higher or lower. You can't say there's a higher God, lower God, God forbid. If God's unlimited, he's everything and nothing and everything and at the same time, there's no description. And that's why Talmud comes to the world of Bria. Because Talmud is Chabad. What's Chabad? Chachma, Bina, Das. Understanding, comprehension, dissecting, applying, etc. That's the logic of the myth of the, of the commandments. The whole Talmud is trying to understand what's the logic. How did Talmud come about? If you want to think about it for a second, how did Talmud come about? The rabbis had the Mishnah. The Mishnah came, let's say, in the end of the second base of the Mikdash, the authors of the Mishnah, till about 100 years afterwards, maybe 150 years afterwards. Then came along, and they all shared things that they heard from their teachers, and that they would tell. What's the, what's the Mishnah? The Mishnah's information that mm-hmm. Rabbi Chia, Abba, and Abai, and Rabbi heard from their teachers, heard from their teachers, heard from their teachers, from Rabbeinu. 
That's what Mishnah is. Now you had a problem. You had two guys who says, one second, my teacher told me this. My teacher told me this. Oh, we got a problem. So which one did Moshe Rabbeinu say? Moshe, the whole Mishnah is oral law transmitted orally from Moshe Rabbeinu till that day. It's all biblical stuff given over. It's not like the rabbis made up the Mishnah. The Mishnah is stuff they heard from their teachers, heard from their teachers, heard from their teachers, etc. So why did Hillel say it's kosher, it's good, and then Shammai say it's no good? They were authors of the Mishnah. We can get to it. We'll talk about that soon. But the bottom line is, now comes along the next generation, the year two, three, four hundred of the common era of nowadays, and the rabbis are saying, one second, well, what, which is the real one? So they start to say, let's try and understand the mitzvah. Let's get the logic behind it. We get the logic, we'll see what really fits. We'll get now, the logic doesn't decide it, but it will tell us which one makes more sense, meaning not logically, but based on how we're meant to interpret the Chumash, how we're meant to interpret the Pasuk, the rules that we know from, the, from our sages, Rabbi Yishmael. How do we come to, they had 13 rules, how to define, and we'll see which one's correct. So the whole Talmud is an intellectual analysis of all the opinions of the Mishnah to try and determine and ascertain which value is correct, which is the correct tradition. So the whole Talmud is really an intellectual journey. That's why it fits into Chabad. That's why the Talmud fits into the world of Bria, because in the world of Bria, you have the intellect of God as it's inserted into Bria, the world of Talmud, the world of analysis, discussion. Um, because the Talmud is, and the reasons are Chabad, that's intellect. It's thinking, okay, so why, how does this make more sense? And meaning it's, it's the, it's, by the way, it's incredible. People who learn Talmud and learn other subjects, you see Talmud is, it really sharpens your eye. It's a, it, mm. it makes your mind refined, it makes you holy, etc. Now, the halacha is atzim, on the other hand, the halacha is, which is going to be, as we'll see soon, the Mishnah, the Mishnah is called halacha is, fact, permitted, aser, mutter, chayer, pater, that is Hashem's emotions in Midas, because what's it all about? Attracted to it, meaning it's good, or push it away. Chesed means pater or mutter, and gvura means aser or chayev. It's, it's the idea, it's all emotions. It's all emotional. And when I say emotional, I mean a lack of, um, a lack of intellect. It means it's based on characteristics of attraction and rejection, etc. Shehein chesed, din, rachemim, etc. That's how he translates here, chesed, gvura, deferes. Chesed is just giving or attraction. Din, which means holding back, also means calculation. What is the right amount? How big should a mezuzah be? How big should fillin be? How long should a dolo be? How long should you have to, how many malachas are in Shabbos? All the analysis of numbers and, and etc. <speaking in Hebrew> From the world of Middais came all the things in the Mishnah and halacha that we find that is forbidden and permitted. That is kosher or pasal, that is obligated or released. Like it says in the Time is it? Let's look a few moments. Yeah. Ubeslap shows machos da tzilos, the machos de bria. So now he's going to go back and describe this pattern of how Torah came down from machos da tzilos into machos de bria, into bria, and then into itzira. Ubeslap shows machos da tzilos and machos de bria. Now you had machos da tzilos come down into Malchus of Bria, meaning through this process, if you go down enough in Bria, where do you come to? Malchus of Bria. Now, where does Malchus of Bria lead to? The top of Yitzira, the next level down. Mm -hmm. So here, and again, what's very important to note, and this is something a, a few times in Tanya Alter Rebbe says this, remember that the inside of each of these things is the essence of the previous world, which is, it's like this babushka boxes. If you want to be really inside. So at the end of the day, even though you, the way you're getting it is you see a giant babushka doll, but if you open everything up, you'll see the inside is still that original. That means the same thing, the Torah we get down here, even though it's going through process, it keeps getting on more and more layers. But what you have, if you go inside, the original, original thing, the Natsilis, is found inside here, if you just uncover the layers. It's not that it's a different Torah, God forbid. It's the same exact Torah, just with more layers and layers of understanding and rules and application and connection to the physical world. And therefore, he says, Malchus, Natsilis, is Malchus, 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 so what's the next stage? That it goes from Malchus, the Bria, into the Holy, the Kedush Kadash. It means each world has the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies of, of, uh, of Yitzira is the result of Malchus, the Bria. Ubi Hislab Shusan, the Malchus, the Yitzira. Now in this new world of Yitzira, then you have all the spirits. Ruchais are a lower form of angels. They're spirits, Ruchais. Vamalachim should be Yitzira, and these are lower form of angels. And the Bria is only the top, top angels. In Yitzira, you have most angels. 
וגם משום היא המשנה שלו לפנינו. And that's where the world of Mishnah. So Tamar, to answer your question, which way we're talking about, depends. In the world of Bria, we're talking about Talmud. In the world of Yitzhira, we're talking about the Mishnah. And that's Allah is Pesukes, actual laws, do, don't. Hanam Shach is Gam Kemen Chabad Shalein Zev Baruch And they also come from the same source of Chabad, the essence of God. But now, these essence of God that was inserted into the wisdom of Torah is now coming to the next level into the emotions, the middays of Torah. These become now the emotions, the middays of Hashem. Like we said before, name of the Gunim, the Shish Svirim Mekan Nabi Yitzira. It says the six spheres, meaning of where do the spheres of Atsilos live? Primarily in Yitzira. Shish sphere means the six mm-hmm. spheres. Mekan becomes the word nest, like a bird's nest. They rest in Yitzira. Just to go back and explain something very important. Just like we say by the nights of the Sukkot, we say every night we have another wish vision. Tonight's wish vision of Avram, the wish of Yitzchak, of Yaakov. They still have all six. We're just talking about what's all seven, I mean. All seven Ushbizim come every night of Sukkot. Mm-hmm. The question is, who's the primary? The same thing is, all the Middays exist within, and all the spheres exist within Bria, exist within Yitzira, exist within Asiya. But what's the primary character of Yitzira is Middays. The primary character of Bria is Chabad. So it doesn't mean that's all that's there. It means the primary character. So the primary character of Yitzira is Middays, and that's the world of Mishnah and Allah. Shehein derech klal, shnei kavin yiminu smel, in general, you can take the spheres and focus them on right and left. Yes and no. That's a general. The spheres are all, uh, even though you have the middle chamber, which is going to be Das, uh, sorry, which is going to be um, Teferis and going to be Yisaid. But in general, in Middays, you have yes and no. I like, I don't like. I hate, I love. It's all the two extremes, which is always going to be in Halacha. It's allowed. It's not allowed. Is there a middle case? Yes. There are cases where the rabbi says, well, in this case, hmm, you know, there, <laughs> I just heard a story um, yesterday from somebody. Um, I forget who was with one of the great, great um, scholars of the last you know, few hundred years that a woman comes to him and asks him a question about a goose if it's kosher. And he looks at the goose and he says, yeah, it's kosher. After, I mean, he looks at the intestines. After he leaves, the so students who were sitting there with him say, Rabbi, but the Taz, the Shach, they say that it's uh, not kosher in such a case. He's unaware of that, but I have an answer. I can explain it. I want to tell you something. After 120 years, they get to heaven, and the shach complains to me that I went against him. I could discuss it with him, but if the goose is going to come to me and say, "Hey, why did you say I was not kosher?" I don't want to sit and argue with the goose. He said, "I'd rather sit and talk to the shach and explain my opinions." But but the, the bottom line is there, uh, there is something called the fifth shulchan aruch. You know, the general there's four volumes of shulchan aruch, four volumes: laws of life, laws of marriage, laws of business, laws of um, court, etc. Uh, Israel and the world of Israel Heter. There's something called the fifth one. The fifth one is to understand a particular case. You know, uh, my grandmother used to tell us an example. The rabbi in Paris, when she was living in Paris, was Rabbi Varkin, who eventually came to New York, and a great rabbi. So her, her mother, was it her mother? Or was it her herself? It, it must have been, it must have been her mother. They were living in Paris, and maybe it was her, I don't know if it was her herself, but she told me the story that they had basically a chicken, that they were, that were those days who went to the butcher shop. That was not the, not in, you had a chicken, you took it to the sheikh and he shafted it, and you took it home and you salted it and cleaned it and took care of it. Now there's a law when you're salting something, you have to leave it on something so the blood could drain out. If it's sitting in a bowl when you're salting it, the, it's, it's actually becomes not kosher because it's like pickling itself inside the blood. You have to have it sitting either on a board or on a slant. So they put the chicken on the, on the special board. But they came back home, they saw it fell off the board. It's like, you know, it's a, chicken's a little slippery, you know? It slipped off and it was sitting the whole day on the, on the floor in their apartment. That's where they did it in their apartment. So she goes to the rub and it's her only chicken she has. She says, what should I do? It fell off the floor. You know, you always check. You don't never pass in yourself, always check. So the rub looks at her, looks at the chicken and says, who told you the floor in your apartment is flat? Go pour some water on the floor and see if it rolls. If it rolls to one side, that's not called flat. So sure enough, nice apartments in Paris, you know, the little place they were, Hotel Prima. They pour it and the water drains a little bit. So it's kosher. You have to know. So there is right, there is left, but also the fairest empathy. Understand the case. Understand the situation. But also in Russia, they, they used to do that. The rabbi has to take the responsibility. Do you know this family doesn't have much? Yeah. And that's Sometimes you have to know. They, they say, 
You can't just look at the chicken. You got to look at the person asking the question too. Okay. Oh, you can't you can't play games with it. But there's also areas where, like here, a regular case, it falls down. You say it fell in. Here, one second. This case. Let's see. Is there? A, yeah. If the floor was slanted, that's different. It's called. Doesn't mean God forbid changing halacha. It means knowing the situation to see how can we apply this in a, a acceptable way to. It's better than tax loopholes. Okay. Um, Let's stop here. I will continue just to, we'll finish the chapter next week in Mertz Hashem. But the point we wanted to cover today was to get an idea that there's a process of Torah coming into this world, bringing Shechina with it. But to understand the process, we really have to understand the spheres and the way Hashem interacts with the world. At the end of the day, the amazing thing is that when someone wants to have a relationship with Shechina, with God, the one way to do it, with Torah, because Torah is the vehicle. It's like, um, you know, when you had a little kid, you have to give him medicine. So you put into the yogurt, the, the pill, the thing. The kid thinks you you don't know. You're getting, you think you're eating yogurt or applesauce, you're really getting the medicine. Here, it's even better. Because not only are you getting Torah, but you're getting the essence of God. So when someone studies Torah, even a more lighter form, what does lighter form mean? It's a Dvar Torah on the Parsha that was said by Rabbi Goldberg, who heard it from the Tukha from Masicha. The bottom line is, inside the Babushka, is the essence. Meaning, when you're learning Torah, as long as it's authentic Torah, as long as it's true, accurate things, as much as it is commentary and insight and understanding, it's the actual mitzvah of oneness with God. And this explains what we said, you know, eight, nine chapters ago, how Torah actually is a more beautiful, intimate connection to Hashem, because you're actually injecting, when you, when you um, Hashem says, but actually now we can understand really beautiful what it says, Anoichi, the first word of the Ten Commandments, is explained, Ano nafshik shavis yohavis. It means, I put my soul into the letters. Now we can understand, Hashem really did. When you learn Chumash, you're actually ingesting God. You become one with God. Hashem really put him in. That's the vehicle that brings Torah into us. That brings Hashem into our lives. Mm-hmm. Anyway, everyone should have a beautiful day. Today is the 7th of Cheshvan, which is the ultimate day that teaches us. The Rebbe has a talk that tells us the ultimate role and example, role model and example for being considerate of others is this week's, this today's date. Why? The 7th of Cheshvan is when they started praying for rain in Israel. Yeah. Even though the farmers needed their rain a few weeks earlier, but they said the farthest it takes, the longest person to travel home from the base of the to get to the farthest destination takes till the seventh of the Cheshvan. So all the farmers around the Israel wait to dive in for rain. So the last guy gets home, he's left to go home in those days of the rain. It's not like today, put on a raincoat. The, mu- the roads got muddy, the traveling was different, the, r- the wagons got stuck. So the consideration, the Rebbe, I was just watching a video yesterday. The Rebbe says that, think about it, the farmers needed rain. But because some Jew they never met, they shouldn't get caught in the rain. He says, I'm going to wait to pray for rain so he can get home. A lot of times you have a class, let's say, starting, and someone didn't get here yet, or you have something. Being considerate, I, that person, let them worry about it. No, we care about each other. And 7th of Cheshvan is the day we start praying for rain in Israel. It reminds us of consideration of other people, even though it's not you. You don't know the person. But, and the, the metaphors, <laughs> I showed the video to my kids yesterday. It has, um, these kids are excited to have the birthday party of some friend that they're making. And the mother says, okay, we're going to go decorate the cake. And then she says, one second, one kid's not here yet. The three kids, the third kid's at home. And she says, we'll wait for him. And one kid says, yeah, let's wait for him because otherwise they're going to be sad. They missed out decorating the cake. And then, of course, they see the same lesson of Zion Cheshvan. Even though we want, we're ready to start, but she's not here yet. You wait for everybody. It's the ultimate. And the Rebbe gives us a great example of, of unity amongst the Jewish people. Anyway, Chaim. Chaim, Chaim, very much.